Good afternoon. I would like to call. Is that on? Yep. Okay. I would like to call the November 2nd, 2023 University Governance and Operations Committee meeting to order. I will ask the staff to confirm we have a quorum. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Please remember that only members of the committee can provide a second to a motion. Live stream of the public meeting is available to the public on youtube.com at the ABOR Live link. This morning, we will discuss general education assessment followed by financial updates for all the three universities. We will also review NAU's campus master plan, a University of Arizona tuition and fee request, and U of A's request to purchase property in Tucson. Finally, we will discuss potential legislation related to statutory mandated tuition waiver along with the proposed adoption of related policy. Before we start our meeting, um, President Crow would like to give some words to the public. Well, thank you. I have to finish chewing my chocolate, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> nice timing, huh? I just tried swallowing it whole, and then my body said, don't do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here and just taking just the privilege of uh, being uh, hosted here at ASU. I want to make sure everybody saw this particular piece of paper on the fabulous uh, Obama Scholars Program that we've had in place since 2009. I want to make a particular point. 17,000 people have received this scholarship. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on this. Uh, uh, but look at the bottom in the gold. This year, uh, the, the fall previous, 1,300 plus scholars, 80% of whom are minority students, 96% of whom are also merit scholars, 62% are coming from families that no one's ever been to college. 61% are uh, Latino or Hispanic, depending on your phraseology. High GPA average, 62% are STEM majors, and the average family income is $20,000. This 1,300 students just in this one scholarship program is more students than we had from that family income attending the university when I took office, period. This is an unbelievable and unbelievably important program. And it has, as you may have heard earlier, I just want to make the point, it is literally not the case that people can't be made into fantastic college graduates by just focusing time and attention and resources on them. How do I know that? 7,400 of these students have graduated, and they come from families with basically no income. They come from you know, situations where there's very little backing them up, yet they're making it. And they're making it because of this particular focus. There are people that think that these things don't make a difference, that supporting the student coming to the institution, mentoring and guiding and bringing them in, it all makes a difference. And so this is not our only scholarship program. This just happens to be one of our scholarship programs. And uh, just I just wanted you to see that bottom gold thing, and particularly the number on the right. Those are average family incomes, not individual incomes, family incomes. So that was my, Correct. I just want to make sure everybody saw this. Yeah. Thank you, President Crow. And we all have um, the uh, information on, on hand if we want to go back to that. So moving to our first item is the adoption of the consent agenda, which is an action item. And all items on the consent agenda are listed at the end of this agenda, underlined and marked with the asterisk. These items will be considered by a single motion with no discussion. All other items will be considered individually. So we should, um, so mo before moving to this, to the next discussions, we should approve the consent agenda items from 9 to 17. Does anyone have any conflict to declare on the item schedule for consent? Here none, I move to the committee that the committee forward to the board for approval items 9 to 17 as listed in the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Mm -hmm. Motions passes. Our next item is the general education quantitative reasoning assessment update. Our first discussion item is the result from our first ever quantitative reasoning assessment. As committee members may recall, board policy requires the universities to assess whether the university's general education programs teach the skills, knowledge, 
and learning outcomes identified in the board policy. The board mandated four areas for assessment, writing, quantitative reasoning, critical thinking, and civic understanding. Last year, the university reported on written communication assessment. This year, the universities are reporting on the quantitative reasoning assessment. So we will have Andrew Conry with our ABOR office and Suzanne Miller Conran with the University of Arizona to begin this discussion. University Provost and General Education um, leads are also here to answer our questions. I will lead, uh, let Andrew and Suzanne you know, um, start the, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Mata. Good afternoon, Regents. Um, yes, so we're talking about quantitative uh, reasoning assessment here. If you cast your minds back to approving all the frameworks for Gen Ed, uh, one of the big four areas was quantitative reasoning, as Regent Mata just, uh, just reminded us. So I thought it was best to start with um, what, uh, what actually quantitative reasoning is and where it fits in Gen Ed, as a reminder. So maybe the most important thing to let you know is that there are two parts to the, uh, to the quantitative uh, uh, portion of the Gen Ed uh, frameworks. Just like as in writing, uh, every student has to take a freshman composition class and then use writing throughout the curriculum. In, in the quantitative area, there's an, an analog to that, which is all students have to take uh, at least one mathematics foundation class. So even if you are the proverbial fine arts major, uh, you still have to take uh, a, a class in, and pass a, a class in college math. You can see a couple of examples. There are actually many permutations for different kind of majors, but they all cover roughly what you see there. Um, in addition to sort of the doing math class, if you would like, uh, the students uh, now under the new gen ed will have to show mastery of quantitative reasoning. And they can do that by completing several courses across the various knowledge areas, uh, depending on which university we're talking about, uh, that have quantitative reasoning embedded in the class. And the reason for this is that when you use quantitative reasoning outside of a math class, for example, uh, it's how do you interact with graphs or charts or actually doing math, that sort of thing. And how do you, uh, in fact, explain what's going on? Those uh, classes, as you can see in the examples I put up on the slide here, can really range across a wide variety of areas. Obviously some science classes you might expect to see in there, but also things like econ, I put in fashion technology because that's, uh, that's an example. Um, it could really be a whole range of classes where you might be using uh, quantitative information and to see how the students can do that. So um, that's where the assessment that we're talking about is going to take place. And I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Miller Cochran here, to, uh, who, by the way, is the chair, this year's chair of the Tri-University Assessment Group, uh, to talk about uh, how they really did this uh, when it comes to setting up the rubrics. All right. Thank you so much, Andrew. I wanted to describe a little bit what we mean when we say quantitative reasoning, just to distinguish that a little bit more clearly from foundations math courses. So when we articulate what quantitative reasoning is on our campuses, we use definitions such as the one you see on the screen, which is the one we use at the University of Arizona. And we highlight that students are drawing conclusions from data. They're critiquing, they're reflecting on, and applying that data in a range of different contexts. So they're doing something with that data um, as opposed to just doing the calculations, although doing the calculations, the computation, of course, is very important, an important component of what we want them to get in general education. But that's what we mean when we talk about quantitative reasoning. It encompasses what they're doing with that data. Um, and on, in the bulleted list there, you see some of the kinds of dimensions of quantitative reasoning that our students are engaging in when they're taking courses in general education on all three campuses. And educators would recognize these verbs as things that appear, for example, in Bloom's taxonomy, engaging in more higher order thinking, um, doing things with data so they're understanding, evaluating, also inferring, perhaps interpreting, applying that data in different contexts. Great. So what you thought it would be was useful would be to show you a few examples. It's hard to know what this looks like. So typically, uh, and you'll see this in a couple of slides, uh, each university is sampling hundreds of, of student assignments from courses that meet the quantitative reasoning um, uh, moniker. Uh, rather than show you an entire five to ten page assignment that 
would, will be, uh, would be assessed. What I've done in here is just taken a few clips out of a few assignments to give you sort of an impression of the kind of things that you might see. So there on the left, for example, uh, is one, uh, it looks like it's from a physiology class, uh, that has some reasonably over statistics in it, so that's fairly obviously quantitative. Um, on the right at the top, someone's comparing sea level and temperature and talking about the relationship. The bottom one is actually one of the fashion tech uh, examples where they're talking about um, value of, uh, of uh, resale apparel. And then a second set of examples right here, again, impressionistic, you're not supposed to read it all, but the one on the left is comparing rents and mortgage, rate and mortgage payments to uh, see what uh, the differentials are. And there's a little clip of that text, a piece of one page. And on the right, uh, I think it was an exercise science class uh, talking about um, body fat and number of push-ups and something that a, uh, a, a client would be doing and then how you would calculate uh, how many, how many uh, hours of exercise that client needed a week on the right-hand side. So those are just a set from all these different classes of the kind of things that would represent quantitative reasoning uh, to give you uh, a feel for, uh, for what this looks like. So back to Susan to tell you about how do you assess this. Right, so we wanted to give you a, a, just a quick overview of how we created the assessment tool, the rubric that we were using as we were scoring these different student assignments. Obviously from the examples that Andrew gave, they cover a wide range of disciplinary perspectives, lots of different kinds of things that students might be doing as they're engaging in quantitative reasoning. So on the Tri-University Assessment Committee, we started with developing a rubric that was based on the, um, the value rubrics by the Association of American Colleges and Universities, but we wanted to take that language and then make it specific so that it worked with our campus's approaches to teaching quantitative reasoning. Some of the language in the AACNU value rubric works really well, um, but some doesn't really match as well what we do on our campuses. So we started by developing that rubric and we used the, the better part of a year, I believe, working on really trying to figure out how that assessment tool needed to be phrased so that it could work well on all three campuses because our curricula are not certainly identical. The three universities used a three-level rating scale, for example, with language such as um, developing competency, meeting expectations, exceeding expectations, so that we could determine what students we're meeting the expectations that we have uh, for where they're at at that level, um, meeting expectations for graduation, and if they're exceeding, um, identifying how many are exceeding those expectations too. We sampled uh, over 500 artifacts on our campuses, looking at representative quantitative reasoning courses. Those ranged from four to nine different kinds of courses from different subject areas, and then used a panel of faculty raters to assess those different assignments. And we were using some of the uh, nationally recognized um, process that AACNU uses when they're calibrating people who are scoring different assignments using the value rubrics that they use at AACNU. And that helps to establish inter rater reliability and consistency, which was a very important part of the process for us. So we used that process to make sure that our scorers were all on the same page as they're looking at those different assignments that they're interpreting the different aspects um, on the rubric in similar ways, even when they're per perhaps looking at some assignments that are a little bit more challenging to score, that they're um, interpreting those and scoring them in similar ways. And then we reported those student rating scores across the different rubric areas and talked about those results um, as campuses with each other. And as you saw in the uh, board book materials, um, those uh, scores are reported there. Each university took some of those verbs that Susan went over earlier and essentially developed their rubric into a set of three or four uh, categories uh, that covered that full range. And so we get uh, the results that you saw um, I put up on the screen here also in the board materials. So at ASU, um, uh, the three groupings they used to evaluate and analyze. In fact, there were sort of two parts of that that corresponded to the um, to the ABOR um, outline for quantitative reasoning. Uh, then there was formulate hypotheses and or models, and then there was communicate. And you can see the individual uh, meets plus exceeds totals uh, on the right-hand side for ASU. Uh, for NAU, uh, there were four categories, contextualize and evaluate, application analysis, interpretation, communication. 
And again, you can see the meets plus exceeds on the right-hand side there. For ASU and NAU, uh, remember that those general ed frameworks are, uh, are still being worked on. And so this is really a baseline test from the current gen ed. Uh, whereas for U of A, which is next, uh, U of A's uh, gen ed program is underway. And so these were sampled from uh, classes out of the, the, quote, the new gen ed. Uh, and again, you can see the four categories U of A use here all in the same vein to the other ones you've seen at the other schools with the uh, meets plus exceeds uh, totals for each of those. So the universities have these back. They also have a lot more detail behind these numbers, demographics and breakouts, as you might imagine, if, uh, 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 and which courses and that sort of thing. But I thought we'd finish uh, the overview by reminding us that assessment has two components. There's the accountability component, literally what we're doing here today, putting the numbers up and showing how people did. But there's also using the assessment process to, uh, to manage the process better, to improve it. And so I thought it was an appropriate place to end to say, fine, the universities have got these numbers, and now what are they going to do about it? So um, I was going to hand off to Susan just to talk very briefly about that, and then I think we'll open it up. Yeah. Um, as Andrew said, these two goals have really been guiding our decision making on the Tri-University Assessment Committee too. Uh, keeping in mind that the assessments are intended to provide some accountability, um, of course, to the Board of Regents, but also to our institutions, to our faculty, and also to our students to make sure that we're doing what we say we have set out to do. Um, and then also we want to make sure that we're using these results as we do the assessments to focus on what kinds of things we can improve. Where do we want to focus our attention? Are there things that we might want to consider shifting in our approach to general education in relation, in, in this case, to quantitative reasoning, to make sure that we're improving teaching and learning uh, in the areas that we're assessing? So we each have slightly different ways, of course, of going about doing that, given the structures that we have for um, for managing general education on our campuses. But these two goals are important for all three campuses. Thank you. Thank you both. Are there any questions by any of the regents? <coughs> Regent Penley. Uh, thank you very much, Regent Monta. First of all, I would just laud you and the members of the Tri-University Committee uh, for really reaching this point. I think when we set up assessment uh, as one of the elements of the revision to general education, we knew this was not going to be uh, an easy task. And uh, you've now addressed two areas, um, and uh, I'm really appreciative. I also appreciate the fact that you and Andrew focused on uh, what you're going to do to bring about change. And I think that's something that we, we need to follow up on with the provost as to, okay, so, uh, you know, if you, you take, for example, uh, formulate hypotheses from ASU, uh, about two in 10 students aren't successful at that. And, and this has been one of my concerns as I listen sometimes to commentators and read various articles that the, the public doesn't really understand how to hold multiple hypotheses and, and try to determine which hypothesis really is closer to the facts and more representative than another one. So it, it just seems to me that if I were Nancy Gonzalez, <laughs> I'd want to look at how I change that. Equally, I could have used one of the other schools as an example. I, I have to say I wish that the underlying elements of this had been more aligned across the three universities, and I would hope that what you'll try to do in the future is to come up with alignment. I mean, I can look here at uh, application and analysis at NAU or analyze, visualize, and quantify at the U of A, uh, and I can look at evaluate and analyze at ASU. I, I, I struggle to see how those are different and, and, and why we couldn't use the same two or three words to describe that and, and a similar approach, I don't understand. And I would challenge you all to do a better job in the future, despite my pleasure with which you've accomplished this in really coming together on something that is gives us as a board and the public, since we are the public's representatives, uh, a better understanding of the success of students across all three universities. Thank you, Regent Monta. Thank you. Any other question? We truly appreciate Andrew and Susan for uh, presenting the information, the data for discussion, and 
Um, since this is a discussion item, um, we look forward to the outcome of next year's assessment on critical thinking. So behind the scene, we know that there's a lot going with the three university, and, and thank you so much. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. So the next item is the request for new academic organizational unit for Northern Arizona University. Northern Arizona University is asking to create a new College of Nursing as a standalone academic unit. This change is presented as the university begins to move under Arizona Healthy Tomorrow's initiatives and will allow the university to focus on efforts to scale and improve nursing outcomes in the state of Arizona. Thank you, um, Provost Puglisi. I was going to ask you to come, but you're already there to discuss, <laughs> to discuss this. Yeah, to discuss this, uh, this new college with us. This is an exciting moment for NAU. So um, we'll, lead, we'll let you, you know, start. Thank you, Committee Chair Mata, uh, Regent Chair Duval, and Regents. I'm very pleased to bring to you this request uh, to create at NAU the College of Nursing. Uh, I was commenting to my colleagues that NAU does not come forward with requests for new academic units very often. <laughs> uh, but in this case, we have a uh, very strong reason to do so. We're mindful of operational efficiency, and we seek to, to sustain an organizational environment that's conducive to collaboration and synergies that uh, are beneficial to the achievement of our mission and goals. Uh, a little bit of history on that. Uh, after downsizing from 10 to 6 colleges way, way back in 2004, uh, digging around, I found that uh, we did transition our honors program to a college in 2016, and we came forward with the proposal to create our College of Engineering, Informatics, and Applied Sciences in 2018. That's it. <laughs> Till today. 2023, uh, we seek to establish the College of Nursing at NAU. This is one of the organizational changes that we're pursuing in support of our NAU Health Initiative and the board's Arizona Healthy Tomorrow uh, agenda. As you know, NAU intends to double the number of uh, health professionals, health professionals in particular that are eligible for clinical practice and licensure uh, in physical health and behavioral health by 2030. Uh, NAU's institutional metrics also uh, track the number of graduates we produce in these areas and the proportion of those that stay in Arizona to practice. So we're very focused on providing uh, opportunities for students to uh, achieve credentials that will allow them to practice and serve communities in Arizona. Nursing is the largest of our health professions programs. It's the strong driver of NAU's impact in this space. Uh, it graduates a growing number of highly qualified practitioners who provide essential clinical care to Arizonans. Uh, a little bit more history. Uh, Air, uh, NAU created its first nursing program in 1962. Uh, a year later, uh, it began to offer its uh, first degrees at the associate's level. Uh, that's at the time at which it was accredited. And then 10 years later in 1973, offered our first baccalaureate nursing degree program. Uh, since then, uh, those uh, nursing programs at NAU have grown in scope uh, and uh, through to the doctorate of nursing practice and established locations throughout the state of Arizona. Over the last decade, uh, nursing programs have grown considerably in their capacity, developed numerous uh, new specializations, multiple modalities, and established additional locations to increase access and production of highly qualified nursing professionals. Uh, NAU Nursing has developed innovative programs that create accelerated pathways for uh, baccalaureate and post-baccalaureate students uh, to complete uh, BSNs eligible for licensure in Arizona. Over the last two years, I'm very proud that the leaders, faculty, and staff of NAU Nursing have responded to the critical shortage of nursing nurses by further expanding locations and creating additional uh, innovative program modalities. I want to highlight a few accomplishments of what is now our School of Nursing. <coughs> Excuse me. The school has, over the last two years, created a new type of accelerated pathway for pre-baccalaureate students. They've launched two uh, of the accelerated pathways for the BSN at our North Valley site. Uh, we've converted our Tucson uh, site for nursing to an accelerated pathway that is now poised to grow. 
Uh, we have uh, increased enrollment uh, and capacity for our, our nursing program in Yuma. We've doubled enrollment in the Bachelor of Science in Nursing program in Flagstaff for fall 23 and for spring 24 coming up. Uh, we've completed the build out of two new simulation centers, one in Flagstaff and one at our North Valley site. Uh, we have refreshed and grown our American Edu Indian uh, Nursing program. Uh, and we are launching two graduate emphases in the program focused on psychiatric health nurse, mental health nurse practitioners, uh, an important area for behavioral health professionals, and a strategic systems leadership program that's uh, being uh, pursued in partnership with industry. Underway right now is an exciting new hybrid BSN licensure program that will combine online didactic training with uh, on the ground, in-person simulation and clinical training. NAU Nursing, in case you don't know, has a very distinctive record uh, of outcomes for its graduates that sit for licensure examinations. NAU's NCLEX RN first time pass, rate, uh, is am pass rates are among the highest in the state uh, and, and uh, even among our uh, three universities. Uh, our pass rate uh, this year to date is at 97 percent and in the second quarter of this year the pass rate was 100 percent. Uh, at the nurse practitioner level, the first time pass rate for the certification is above the national benchmark. We think the, skies, the size, scope, and complexity of nursing programming and operations will be better situated as a freestanding college. Led by its dean, the college will reconfigure its internal organizational structure, its business processes uh, to support strong executive direction, agility, uh, and effective operations for a geographically dispersed pr set of programs that must sustain alignment with highly prescriptive accreditation requirements. As a college, the dean and her team will be more strongly positioned to develop new partnerships, uh, raise and manage resources, and support continued growth of NAU nursing programs and their impacts across the state. With your approval of our request to establish the College of Nursing, we have lined up and will put in place an outstanding leader as its inaugural dean, Dr. Janina Johnson. Dr. Johnson has been with NAU as the executive director of our School of Nursing for about one and a half years, and in that short time, she has led the school through transformative changes that have already delivered results for the people of Arizona. We look forward to the next era uh, of NAU nursing and an era of growth, innovation, and leadership and improving healthcare across the state. Uh, thank you for your consideration of our request. Thank you, Provost um, Puglese. And we're, we're very excited to hear all of the innovations that you're bringing to the, to the different programs and also resources. And to all, uh, Yuma, which is you know, one of the area that is growing and the community of the rural areas also. And it's very interesting that you mentioned that hybrid with online, some of the simulation, that would be very interesting because as we know, online is growing very fast and one of the other theme that we uh, discussed in our last meeting. So thank you. So with this, if there are any questions or comments by other regions or by the regions? Hear none, thank you. Provost Puglisi, I move that the committee forward to the board for approval. Northern Arizona University's request for a new academic organizational unit as described in the executive summary. If there's a second. Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. <laughs> Any abstentions? Motion passes. So the next item is for discussion of fiscal year 2024 financial status reports fall update. Item three is a discussion on the university's financial status. So I would like to invite Brad, who is next to me, and I wanted to share my microphone with him from, the, from our AWAR office. So I didn't want to emphasize on that, but um, <laughs> I will introduce this item. So after which the university C CFOs will each update the committee on their institution's financial status. So Brad, the stage is yours. Thank you. I will now claim the microphone. Uh, Regent Mata, thank you, Regents. Uh, just as a basic reminder, the ABOR financial policies have really three big financial check-ins. 
during the year with the universities. Uh, the first, well, I guess there's no particular order, but the last one that you heard was in June when the universities come forward with their budget requests for the year, which also includes information on how they're anticipating ending the fiscal year that they're in, as well as the assumptions that are planned uh, for the next upcoming year, enrollment projections and so forth. We then circle back with the universities this time of year in the fall, so this November meeting, to talk about uh, how the fiscal year actually ended, how the state budget process went, and how enrollment and first quarter expenditures are stacking up that informs what the university is facing for the rest of the year that we are currently in. We then discuss again in January to talk about financial indicators and projections for the remainder of the year, which then sets the stage for the next budgetary cycle. So it is with that understanding that again, we take on this fall report, which talks about both how we reconciled the end of the fiscal year of 2023, as well as how we've begun and what we are looking at as it relates to 2024 and beyond. So as uh, Regent Mata mentioned, um, if there are no questions about what we're discussing, the universities are prepared to then walk through some of those details through each of their lenses. Regent thank Mata. you, yeah, thank you, Brad. Okay, my microphone is back to me. <laughs> So we'll first hear from Morgan Olsen, presenting for Arizona State University. Morgan, the stage is yours. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. So. Um, I would suggest uh, if you're interested in following along, you look at uh, page nine of uh, the materials there. There is the uh, actual report uh, that we filed with the board staff. I'll talk a little bit first about last fiscal year uh, in a June 30, 2023. Uh, overall, uh, a good year. Uh, as you can see uh, from the materials, we ended up with a change in net position essentially in non-accountant speak that's the, the the revenues on a gap or generally accepted accounting principles basis less the expenses of just about 190 million dollars uh, more than the original budget which you won't see uh, on that uh, page that original budget was about 39 million so uh, we uh, clearly uh, exceeded uh, the original expectation significantly that was due to a number of factors um, the last couple of years the legislature has uh, gone pretty late uh, into the spring or even early summer and and so we've uh, uh, you know set budgets uh, uh, before knowing our actual outcome on uh, uh, state investment so we ended up with some one-time uh, capital grants in our case about 54 million dollars uh, that uh, weren't anticipated we also uh, had better than expected enrollment which resulted in uh, a net increase in tuition and fees beyond budget. Similarly, in the area of sponsored uh, grants and contracts, uh, we uh, exceeded our budgeted expectations. We also benefited uh, from some uh, aid uh, from uh, the, the pandemic, federal aid that was passed through the state in various forms, which we appreciated. Uh, in doing that, of course, we also uh, exceeded our originally budgeted expenditures in a number of uh, places compensation, uh, uh, salaries and wages and, and fringe benefits would be the major one. Uh, you know you're going to do that right away if uh, all of the things being equal, if you do better than expected with uh, research grants and contracts because essentially those are budget incurring. You, you know, gonna, you're going to spend those dollars on the purposes for which the grants were intended. Uh, so we, of course, did that. Um, overall, uh, our revenue uh, increased from the budget by about $324 million. Uh, and a variety of categories for that, I won't go into the details unless somebody's particularly interested, but uh, the one thing that I did want to uh, point out to people was that uh, over the last uh, two years, our, our net position, think of that as net assets perhaps, uh, increased about $490 million, uh, which is about a 30% increase. Uh, we also ended uh, fiscal year 23 for the first time with a $2 billion plus net position. So. You know, uh, given the last couple of years and all the stuff that went on during them, I think that's a, a pretty good outcome. So we were, we were happy about that. If uh, there are any questions about last year, I'd be happy to address them. Well, yeah, uh, thank you for the update. And is there any questions from the region? Yeah, President Crow. Uh, Madam Chair, I don't, I don't have a question. I just want to make a, a comment. So, so a long time ago, we realized that this was a heavily self-financed public enterprise university for which 
our pathway to the success of our mission was the acquisition of resources. We could not succeed at our mission unless we acquired the resources. We would be foundationally invested in by the people through the legislature, but that would be a tiny fraction of our money. And so we could tell a story behind each of those items that lead to these revenue changes and all the things that are in the pipelines that are related to revenue changes. And I, I know it's in, in the university business, you're not ever supposed to use the word revenue. You're not supposed to use the word margin. You're not supposed to use the word financial design, but we have no choice but to pursue revenue with margin for reinvestment in the rest of the mission of the institution. So if you get a note from me or Morgan or Nancy, Nancy and I were just in Australia together. Uh, she went to Egypt earlier this year, or last year, I was in Egypt. We're not on vacation. <laughs> we are pursuing revenue <laughs> and partnerships and alignments. And so I just want to sort of give you some sense of that, of that connection. I mean, these are, these are, these are, uh, this is a very, very, very complicated and difficult thing to build that we've been building largely since the financial crisis of 2008 uh, on this completely new model because it was at that point that we realized that the, there was no chance that the state that would really ever become a major operating partner. They would become a catalytic partner, a student investment partner, and perhaps a capital partner. Uh, and this, it's not that the state hasn't been a partner, but I just wanted to sort of put into perspective those things. Yeah, thank you so much because um, your comments about how you bring new revenue, although like you say, we cannot talk too much about just bringing revenue, yes. partnerships with different organizations, even in the traveling. I always say that sometimes when we sit down in the airport with someone, and that person can be a key component of the future two or three years later. We're, we're so, hawking yeah. everyone. All yeah, time. every, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Including sitting in the airport. Yeah, that's why we're, I was saying that we look at, you know, the, everybody should look at opportunities and even though we don't see it in that moment, we don't, we don't say that he's like a financial person, but looking at opportunities will bring a broader way of how, you, how we can say it, uh, have new partnership in a way and directly and indirectly. And indirectly, sometimes that person will guide us to the next one, to the next one, and then maybe in, the, in that tunnel, the fifth one is the one that is bringing us that, you know, partnership. So thank you so much, President Crow. Question. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, President uh, Mason. Morgan, um, this relates to last year, but really relates looking forward. There's a lot of one-time money in those improvements over the last two years um, as it relates to revenues. Looking forward without those one-time monies, where does ASU end up? Is it a just a revolving wheel of additional one-time money that we're required to provide? How are how are you looking through that window? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Regent Manson. I appreciate that that question. I think maybe the best way to answer it is to start to talk about this fiscal year. You know, our, our report through the the first quarter, and uh, as the board knows, uh, the last few years the legislature has. Uh, uh, chosen to make a uh, series of funding decisions that they identify in their process as being one-time allocations. Uh, the example, you know, last year we had a $54 million one-time appropriation for capital. Mm -hmm. By definition, that, that's gone this year. Uh, so our, our total uh, uh, state investment for 24 compared to 23 is down significantly, and even more so if you uh, exclude the things that are for non-operating purposes. And so that's been a trend the last few years. I would say that one of the challenges there is it makes it very difficult to plan. Uh, you know, typically uh, with a with a university, you know, we are we are uh, uh, producing. Uh, human capital and, you know, and, and improving the capacity of that human capital. And to do that, that, you know, in addition to other things, takes people. Uh, people expect to get paid, you know, every, every payday. And so it, it's challenging if you have, uh, you know, uh, revenue streams that are not continuing. 
And, and so we work around that, as President Crow said, and, and you know, because uh, over uh, 90 cents on each dollar that ASU spends is coming from other places than state investment, you know, that, that uh, uh, we don't always enjoy that, but it's been helpful in terms of dealing with those types of problems. But uh, if you look at our numbers uh, on, on page 9 there, you can see that we'd originally budgeted uh, a, uh, an increase in net position for this year of about $79 million. And as a we, we've updated our projections for things we know now that we didn't know at the time this was put together, we've actually uh, written that down by about 10 million, 10.1 million to be exact, it's about 12.8%. Uh, so we're projecting about a $69 million increase in net position for the year. And again, that's a number of things, but you know, some of that uh, uh, decrease in state investment uh, is contributing to that, uh, as well as we know that We've benefited from money that's been passed uh, through from the federal government related to the pandemic, and uh, that uh, that money has you know sort of lasted longer than we thought it would. And part of our strategy, frankly, was to focus as much of that as we could on uh, student aid, you know, student success, and and uh, but, but not all of it. As some universities did. Very, a very significant part went to institutional operations, but now everything that's left is, is sort of money that we plan to spend over a couple of year period on student aid. As that goes away, obviously, our, our commitment to student success doesn't, so we have to pick that up other places. And so you see that sort of embedded in, in what we're doing here. Uh, you know, we've been fortunate that uh, TRIF has uh, over-earned from, you know, sales tax ac activity uh, in the state relative to our multi-year plan that the board approved. And so we see that reflected here in terms of some money that the board allocated toward the Healthy Arizona Initiative, in our case, you know, to help fund our startup ASU Health Initiative, a lot of activity around that. And so uh, our revenue increase is uh, up about $56 million, or 1.4 percent, over the budget that we established. And, you know, as I said, state appropriations down, uh, research grants and contracts up, et, et cetera. On the expense side, uh, we wrote that up a little bit more about $66 million, so that's that $10 million negative differential uh, in uh, net position for the end of the year that we I'll project just, just make one by next June 30. On, I might, Morgan, I'll just make one sure. comment on that, and that is that obviously it's a two-part equation, revenue and expenses, and so, you know, we're making conscious decisions of where to take risks and where to, you know, affect our net margin in ways, but the investments that we're making along the way then are also driven by our longer-term objectives of the financial outcomes that we're pursuing. So we realize that we're, as a public enterprise, we're operating on a revenue acquisition investment strategy modality which requires a certain kind of psychology and a certain kind of way in which the university operates, not just centrally but within the units also. And so we've been working through culture change within the entire institution's way of thinking relative to this issue. So we will make decisions where you know, we had to do a number of expenditure, anticipated expenditure or desired expenditures reductions along the way that we've done for the year that we're in right now, uh, which were painful. Uh, but the level of, of lowering of that net position was a function of the final decision of where we thought we were with some positive revenue numbers, and, but, you know, complicated. More, more to come. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll mention uh, one more thing and then stand for questions. Uh, you know, one of, one of the things that the uh, board asks us to do is maintain our uh, liquidity, net days uh, or cash on hand on a monthly basis uh, within a plus or minus 25 percent range of sort of the Moody's metric for our types of universities. Uh, with the projections I just shared with you for this year, we anticipate that we'll be at about 172. Uh, and that's obviously comfortably within the range that you you see in the materials here. So uh, we're pleased about that. And then finally, uh, you know, we had in our 23 budget about 90 million dollars of uh, one-time uh, funds that came from state investment. Uh, this year, it's about uh, 21 million, all related to the new economy initiative. So a negative swing of about $70 million. So that's just one of the things that's embedded in all these numbers that we're working through, as President Crow said, to make sure, you know, the numbers are just numbers, but they're really the embodiment of what we're able to do in terms of uh, reaching our mission. And that's the which, important which, which thing. Which means, though, that we're eating swings of $70 million and still ending up with the net positive position where we are. So. 
So, Madam Chair, if there are yeah. questions, I'll be happy yeah. to address so, them. So I have a question, and then I will open it to the to the region if they have any other question. So, President Crow, you mentioned that to get to the level that you needed to do, you have to work on some cultural change. Can you expand on that? Because so one of the things that I learned in my 11 years on the front lines at Columbia University is the failure of the way most universities operate financially. So they operate in a responsibility-centered management modality where there are little fiefdoms within the university that argue with each other and have taxes with each other. And the fact they have little, little uh, I don't know what to call them, uh, little matches and little little fiefdoms. I was going to say something cruder, but I didn't. <laughs> they, they, I chose not to. So, so. Um, uh, and I, I swore to myself when I got here that I wouldn't be party to such a thing, that we were going to have an institution which had a, a way in which we were all together and that we would, we, would, we would work together to make the institution successful. So we have, I don't know what we call it, Morgan is one of the world's expert on, experts on all these things, but we have a centralized budget for more than three billion dollars of our uh, revenue and then we have a decentralized budget for two billion dollars of our revenue and the centralized budget tries to cover as much of all things so for instance what i mean by this um, regent mata is that is that uh, the deans the executives within the in the institution are all working together for that central number and so there's not a, a discussion of the taxes between colleges or the law school has to generate more revenue so that we can fund the teacher's college or this group or this group or this group. We don't have any of those discussions. And therefore, we don't break down into the culturally abhorrent arguments and debates between and among academics who believe that their discipline is better or more important or they deserve this or they deserve that. And they, why are you funding them more and why are you funding them less? And so uh, uh, Provost Gonzalez is here and, and, and others could comment on this. And so the structure was a different budget model with, I think we have one central tax, the administrative. Yes. We don't have exchanges or taxes or other things. And so that means, for instance, I'll just use an example. So the Ed Plus at ASU operation, which supports now the generation of $900 million, give or take, of new revenue from our online activities by working with the colleges, all of the schools at no unit cost of transaction. It's just a service. Now, yes, it's taken off the top from the revenues that they're generating to fund these things. And so, and I'll let Morgan modify or edit these comments that I'm making. So the notion is that we built a different budget model. We incentivize the deans to cooperate versus to fight. We incentivize the deans to share resources share activities, share things going along as opposed to fighting, 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 fighting. Uh, we we uh, hire executives uh, uh, like Morgan and his team and others that are here uh, who are experts at this and uh, the fact they are not. Uh, and so the fact they are not experts in the finances of the institution and some of our faculty that are listening are here. I saw Paulina somewhere. I don't know where she went. There's just <laughs> some, some of our faculty that are here. We work with them. We talk about what we're doing, but they don't, they don't help manage the financial outcome of the institution. They help manage the, the purpose of the institution, the trajectory of the institution, the intellectual design of the institution. So we separated that. That's not the case at lots of universities. At, at, at many universities, there's a, a, a different role. Uh, and so, and so, uh, We've made those changes. What else is a little bit different here, Morgan? Well, I, I think the, you captured it really very well. I, I would describe our, our model basically as being a planning-driven model. It, it you know starts with what are the what are the things that we want to achieve, uh, and uh, one of the one of the challenges, of course, is is putting together the resources to do that, and you have to be able to essentially direct and inflect resources to be able to do that and and uh, we do have incentives for things that we want people to do and disincentives for things that we'd like to discourage people from but uh, people being deans and directors so you know <laughs> other executives <laughs> just for the record but uh, we're not talking about drinking too much or, <laughs> but, but but seriously uh, you know there uh, so so Nancy Gonzalez and I work together very closely on these things along with uh, uh, a few of our colleagues and and uh, the system is designed uh, to blame that small group you know for everything that's uh, not according to someone's uh, 
uh, pleasure, but uh, it, it generally it does <laughs> does work does work uh, uh, pretty well. You know, there's never en enough resource to do everything everyone wants to do. I mean, after all, university is a you know place full of really really smart people with great ideas, and all they need is the money to you know accomplish it. So that's always the challenge. Uh, but uh, for us, I think it's it's been a, a good approach that has allowed us to be pretty opportunistic. And pretty nimble, and uh, you know, I, I think I do think that the next few years are going to be challenging, uh, with you know, unless there is uh, some increased uh, state investment, then you know we'll continue to solve as best we can uh, by generating revenues elsewhere. You know, through partnerships, through charitable giving, we've been able to continuously grow enrollment. Uh, we did that again this year. It, it didn't grow as much as it has in past years, and so we're watching that pretty carefully. We know there's some demographics involved there that, uh, you know, we need to uh, essentially continue to overcome uh, to a certain degree. But uh, that's uh, that's kind of my take on it. The, 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 the last thing I would add is this notion of uh, the planning model. So in planning and budgeting systems, there's a model called the planning budgeting system model, which is a different financial model, and it's the financial model that we use. We also operate that system with a very long-term view. So we have projects underway right now in which we're devoting fair amounts of energy, fair amounts of argument, fair amounts of we don't know if it's going to work or not. But if they do work, our anticipated revenue enhancement in one of the projects is $400 million a year on a very tiny investment, so a very high margin return. And this is our relationship with some of the international university partners that we have. And so we have several of those projects. So one of the strategies that we have is to launch many ships hoping that some return with fish. Uh, and, and so, and, and so, because they don't. And so if you launch one ship, I mean, good luck. And that, the, the standard academic mind is a mind of caution. The standard academic mind is the mind of, of think it through in every possible way so you have the lowest probability of failure. Yeah, we don't really do that. And so, so it doesn't mean we don't think about it, but we might launch five, six, six, seven things. So when we acquired Thunderbird School for Global Management, the assumption was that we would acquire a brand, 45,000 alums, a reputation of an institution that was not going to make it. But if we could restore that and make those things happen, that would over time become a a new opportunity for us for partnerships and investments and making things happen and it's proving to be it's proving to be the case and so we take on some of these things the projects in Los Angeles the, the, the other things that we're doing these are all intended to allow us to find a way to our pathway so one way to look at this is that for us to achieve the numeric goals that we've given this board these are not financial goals but the output goals numbers of graduates scale of impact research activities and so forth we have to find another 1.3 to 1.7 billion dollars of revenue per year to achieve the goals. Revenue is not our goal. The goal is the outcome. That you you don't do that in a normal academic culture where every unit is arguing about their own little nest and whether or not they got enough enough uh, sugar water or whatever they need for for their nest among the hundreds of nests within the university. And so there's a phrase that, we, that, that I used to use at Columbia, which was interesting. I said, this is a vector summing problem in which the outcome is always zero. There's no way to make any progress because the vector sum of the arguments always negates everything out to the fact that then there's no ability to make any forward movement in the direction you want to go. So, so our vector sum is, remains positive. Not always as positive as we would like it to be, but, but positive. Thank you, President Crow. This was a, you know, thank you for sharing all this information and, and, and um, to the board. So I want to ask if there's any other question from the region, uh, Regent Herbo. Morgan, uh, if you look at auxiliary revenue and other revenues, it's like $400 million. Um, are these, you Sadly. know. Sadly. <laughs> are these a bunch of really, really small things, or are there a few components that stick out? because uh, this is a big amount of money to count on. Right, yeah. Uh, so uh, Regent Herbold, it is actually an accumulation of things. So our, for example, uh, uh, housing and dining operations uh, would be included in auxiliaries. Our uh, uh, 
Sun Devil Marketplace and other college stores would be included in that area. They're basically uh, uh, functions within the university that are generally expected to operate on the revenues that they generate to be to be self-sustaining and and to produce margin also. It, uh, ideally, to produce margin, yes. Ideally. Thank you. Is there any other question by any regent? Thank you very much um, for the update, Morgan. So next, we will hear from Boyorn Flugstaff regarding Northern Arizona University, and the stage is yours. Thank you, Chair Mata, members of the committee. Uh, to begin, uh, fiscal year 23 ended uh, strong uh, for NAU. Uh, we had projected uh, at what uh, uh, Brad had noted in June, uh, a net position, a bottom line increase of uh, $12.8 million. We came in above that uh, at uh, just under $55 million uh, positive, largely driven by a, a couple uh, significant items, one being a recognition of a art collection donation that came through from the foundation. That was about $25 million uh, to the good, and then uh, $10 million of uh, GASB uh, OPEB, uh, other pension uh, obligation uh, accounting entries. So uh, those really uh, were positive uh, and really helped uh, the bottom line. But even without those two items, we still would have exceeded our, our projection by $5 million on the bottom line. Uh, we also remained uh, within the day's cash on hand liquidity range for the board for last year as well, uh, where we ended uh, at uh, 180. Uh, so good, strong, uh, uh, positive uh, for uh, the bottom line fiscal year uh, liquidity. <coughs> Moving to this year. This year, uh, we did have uh, enrollment growth, bottom line enrollment growth for FTE uh, for the first time uh, in, in several years, 1.8% nearly 500 FTE growth versus uh, prior year, which was a very positive uh, for NAU, uh, largely driven uh, by graduate. Graduate enrollment FTE has continued to be strong for NAU, seven consecutive years of growth uh, for uh, NAU. But we also did see undergraduate uh, uh, increase year to year too. So that was a very positive uh, note uh, for our um, enrollment. As compared to budget, uh, we were slightly below uh, where we had uh, budgeted just in terms of FTE, um, largely driven by our under, undergraduate and our undergraduate WUI. That was really the one item uh, f compared to budget where we were uh, slightly below um, in, in terms of our projection. However, even with that, we are seeing year to year enrollment uh, net tuition fee growth, which is a good sign, as well as year-to-year -year growth in uh, net tuition and fee revenue per FTE. So both of those two uh, growing year-to-year, -year, which is, is a positive uh, outcome. Overall, what does that mean? It means that we are still maintaining what we had uh, projected for our bottom line in terms of uh, net position uh, for the year. Uh, we're still maintaining our day's cash on hand projection uh, for the year. Um, and we are expecting to see strong auxiliary revenue growth, which Regent Herbal had mentioned. Our auxiliary revenue growth is largely our residence halls, our housing revenue. That has continued to be very strong year to year, and that continues to be uh, driven by demand as well as uh, increased rate, as well as our parking and dining uh, is also very strong, which is helping to see that auxiliary revenue growth exceed last year and exceed our budgeted number. So we are s still seeing what that, um, uh, revenue growth year to year uh, is, and what translates into the the bottom line. Uh, no change on the on the bottom line. So maybe I should just stop there, see if there's any questions, and I certainly can answer uh, any of those questions. Thank you, Bjorn, and thank you for the update. Are there any questions? 
Regent Herbor. Um, salaries and benefits compared to last year. Yep. Compared to the actual last year, looking at the budget, are about flat. So I know you've given some increases. We, uh, Regent Herbold, we have given increases, um, and our projection uh, is uh, up uh, for this year, and it's up uh, versus where we were last year uh, of about uh, 15, 15 million dollars. Uh, if you look at where we were versus uh, last year, the projection this year versus where we ended last year, so there is an investment. We are up over what we had budgeted. You know, that's largely due to, uh, as was mentioned, some of our grants and contracts is coming in much stronger uh, than what we had planned, and that's largely people. Uh, so we having the funding source coming in through sponsored projects to help uh, fund uh, some of those salary uh, and benefits costs. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any other question at the region? Here, none. Thank you so much for the, I haven't, yeah. Do you have any? No, okay, sorry. Thank you for the update. And um, we finally will have Lisa Rolney um, to update the committee regarding the University of Arizona. Go ahead, Lisa. Right, thank you. Chair Mata, uh, Chair Duvall, Regents, I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. I recognize that the submission that you received probably feels like a drastic change for University of Arizona in comparison to previous outlooks, so I appreciate the opportunity to share some context on the information that we provided in our submission and to share how we've already begun to tackle the challenges that we face. So you know me, I'm a bottom line on top. <laughs> uh, the last few months have exposed uh, the depth of our financial vulnerabilities and that we must immediately address. Uh, our financial health is fragile, as you see here on this slide. Uh, we've talked, the other two universities have talked about the state of Arizona's uh, lack of investment in the three institutions, but I also want to focus on the, the troubling financial outlook for the state is unlikely to result in meaningful operational support for any of us for some time. Uh, so we can't count on that uh, to, to help us forward. Uh, our guiding principles and goals, uh, such as doubling research and repeatedly attracting the highest caliber class, require sustained and substantial investment. And as I'll explain, for a variety of reasons, a number of our areas in our community need immediate support support to remedy financial deficits. So hard choices are inevitable. We need to focus our efforts, um, and that will mean deciding what to do, just as much as what not to do. These challenges are at the institutional level, and they also require, uh, specific units require intervention. Uh, and while their negative impact on our financial situation is clear today, please know that those are in the minority. Uh, so there is a path forward. There are opportunities for our leaders to demonstrate courageous leadership, varying responses to specific areas, and to demonstrate our values by bringing our community together around a shared understanding of the path forward. So, and we're already taking steps in that direction. So for now, as you've requested, I'm gonna share a little bit about where we end fiscal year 23, what's happening with enrollment, where we're currently heading for 24, and then the steps that we're already taking to ensure better outcomes. Okay, so let me quickly start where we ended fiscal year 23. So uh, when we're comparing forecast to actuals, we had a positive net increase. Uh, let me tell you what you're looking at here. This is not new information, but it's not exactly in your board book. Uh, these are Informations, as Brad described in the very beginning, we have kind of three touch points when we talk about financials. So the first column is um, the quarterly financial status update that we shared with you last November, this time last year. The middle is our annual operating budget that was using March data and we shared with you at the board meeting in June. And the right is our audited financials that are shared in your packets today. Since that's an eye chart, <laughs> 
just going to uh, call this out. You can see from the bottom right that we ended our net position positive, basically $80 million. That's admittedly lower than the forecast that I shared with you in June, which was 95.3, but still an increase from our quarterly financial status update, which was only $30 million that I shared in uh, November of last year. So a very positive year for, for our University of Arizona. And then looking at enrollment, I'm just going to give you some, some high points. Uh, so you asked us how enrollment has changed since we shared the information with the board in June and any budget adjustments that we had to make based on those changes. Uh, so this year again, we have more students and a more diverse and academically prepared, prepared class than last year. Uh, therefore, in our quarterly financial status update that you just received, we reforecast tuition to include the increase in headcount and the increased investment in these students. Uh, when you're looking at your packet, you, you might have wondered why it looks like our headcount increased over 3,000 FTE since I talked to you about this in June. Uh, the, the vast majority of that increase is due to a change in counting methodology. For international students, uh, IPEDS definition requires that we uh, count our microcampus students. So there's an increase related to that. But the biggest increase is a change in the way we count uh, medical students, which was a request from board staff. The medical school students, uh, we have always counted by each head. Uh, the way they are required to be counted by statute, which is very, very, very old, says that we should be counting by the number of classes that a student takes. And our medical school students take a lot of classes. So while we did not increase 3,000 heads, we're really pleased that we have 1,000 more students uh, than we projected we would have when I shared this information with you uh, in June. And I would like to thank Casey Orquidez and the enrollment management team uh, for all of their work to bring in that class. Okay, so that leads us to how we are, um, how the last few months of data have been refined uh, from our forecast for the remainder of 24. Overall, we remained largely on target, uh, except for some shifts in accounting, which both Bjorn and Morgan already mentioned, the, the pension and OPEB uh, actuary entries. So I'm going to first start with UHEC, and I know this is even more of an eye chart. It's in, if you want to follow along with me, it's page 23 of item 3 in your chart, but I'm going to help you out with that. The, the really the only variance here for UHEC are non-cash entries for depreciation and amortization um, that we did not have during the annual operating budget process. We only received an operating budget from UHEC, not those accounting entries. Uh, so I'll just remind you that in June, I, when we talked about UAGC, I let you know that their net position uh, would be a decrease of $18.3 million, and that was because of the transition to University of Arizona benefits are higher than UAGC benefits, and they were making critical investments in IT infrastructure, and they were bringing the cash with them to cover that. So what happened here at this quarterly financial status update, you see now that it looks like their net position is negative 34.4. This is entirely due to um, depreciation and amortization, so it's not a real loss. Uh, and the great news is that I just received information this week that's not in the packet from our UHEC finance team that they are seeing better than expected revenue and less than expected expenses, resulting in a $5 million improvement over what we see here. Okay, so then for the University of Arizona, this is on page 20 of item 3, I know it's an eye chart. Um, you can see that UAGC, back to that depreciation and amortization, UAGC accounts for 16 million of the 27.6 variance, uh, and the, the variance, the rest of the variance for the remainder of U of A is related to GASB rule changes 96 and 87, for, <laughs> which was similar to 23. And then uh, similarly to uh, ASU and NAU, we also have seen um, incredible growth in our grants and contracts. So we have reforecast an increase uh, in grants and contracts on the revenue side, which then means that uh, we will also see a corresponding increase on expenses for the salaries, wages, benefits, and all other operating expenses related to 
that activity. Okay. So speaking about liquidity, I think that it's um, it's important for us to um, set a framework to remember that for the last five years, we have significantly invested in our strategic plan, and those plans, various goals, were always designed to focus primarily, primarily on the mission, to get us to the fourth industrial revolution, and to increase our rankings. They were not necessarily focused on revenue generation. We just had a conversation with President Crow and with Morgan about um, what is the, the, we have a mission focus, not a uh, bottom line focus in higher ed, but as President Robbins will say, with, if there's no money, there's no mission. Uh, so from a mission perspective, uh, we have been wildly successful. Uh, what you're looking at here on the screen is just the last two years of data, the progress that we've had on all the initiatives in the strategic plan. So what I'm sharing here with you on this screen is a longer period uh, that looks at our day's cash on the fluctuation in our day's cash on hand at U of A than you have in your board books. I want to first start by acknowledging that uh, when I shared our annual operating budget forecast for day's cash on hand in June, um, it was based on budget data that we pulled in March, and that's an approach that we've used for the last 10 plus years. I want you to know that when I told you that it was going to be, I, we were forecasting 156 days cash on hand, I was not hiding the ball or trying to obfuscate a problem that we, w w that, that we have at the University of Arizona. This method that we've used uh, for the more than 10 years has always been reasonably close to actuals. Unfortunately, this year, it gave us an estimate that ended up being 30% over actuals. So we immediately modified our review model to include budget, uh, to date actuals, and a regression analysis that reviews the last nine years. And if we had used that new method when I gave you the figure, what I would have told you is that we were projecting to be 105 days cash on hand, which is even less than what you see. And the difference is that we all would have been talking about this trend a few months earlier than we are today. So importantly, uh, I, rather than how is this point estimate calculated for a ratio is understanding what caused the drop. So we have always recognized that the intensity of our strategic investments could not continue without end. Mm -hmm. And you'll recall, recall that during the pandemic, we dialed back those strategic um, <coughs> investments. And what's happened is that we no longer have enough centrally managed strategic reserves to weather fluctuations. And that's the result of our planned investments in initiatives outlined in our strategic plan, as well as other investments that we knew were critical for our mission. Think marketing, personnel retention, IT infra infrastructure for cybersecurity, and a combination of uh, significant unexpected demands, safety expenses, utility increases, legal expenses. Uh, we have always assumed that we had more time to dial back uh, on strategic investments and prepare for the next opportunity and to build back our reserves. However, in the last few months, it's obviously become clear that our position is precarious and already turned downward. So the short of it is that our rising costs due to our mission success and our uh, associated increase in activity, as well as inflationary increases, are outpacing our revenue goals, revenue gains. So this is magnified by specific units that are using reserves to fund activity. And the reasons vary uh, by unit, as do the approaches that we will take in each situation. So there is a pathway back to financial sustainability. You saw that our, um, our day's cash on hand after the global financial crisis uh, was very low. Uh, we know that we must take a multi-pronged approach. We have to have a university-wide approach uh, with methods to build back that central reserve, and we need to have targeted methods for specific units that have acute issues. We have already implemented in fiscal year 24 a 2% budget reallocation across the institution, and we're considering methods such as pausing capital projects, hiring freezes, not implementing a salary increase program for fiscal year 25, revisions to our budget process, and po possible further uh, additional reallocations. For specific units, 
we're focused on those acute issues uh, that have already been identified and understanding we understand how to address them uh, we will create working groups or what we call tiger teams uh, to go in and actually support those units in in turning around the trends uh, so we take this concerning situation we take this concerning situation very seriously and we are already actively working um, to enhance our liquidity position and provide <clears throat> lasting long-term fixes in the units that that need uh, assistance and right sizing I'll stop there and ask President Robbins if he has anything to add or if there are questions uh, from regions thank you Lisa President Robin do you have any I think Lisa uh, summarized it well um, uh, we, we made strategic investments in a lot of different things. I think the growth of what we uh, have achieved in, in our class, bringing our class in, that costs money. Uh, you know, $300 million a year in financial aid, a lot of it in merit support, um, as well as need-based aid. Uh, the growth in research has is, is come about because of uh, specific uh, strategic, strategic investments uh, that we've made. And then there is, Lisa said, there are a few uh, units um, across the university that are struggling, not the least of which is athletics. And, um, you know, we, we had assumed when we used days cash on hand to um, support athletics that there would be an increase in revenue, uh, and it's just not turned out to be the case. Um, unfortunately, uh, I think that uh, the situation we find ourselves in with the Pac-12, uh, that situation may not get better before it gets worse. So, uh, as Lisa said, we've got plans to address this issue to build back the central reserves, and uh, I, I'm confident we're going to be successful. Thank you, President Robbins. Um, I'm going to ask the regents if there are any questions. Thank you, Lisa, for the update. Yeah, yeah. Um, Regent Duvall, Chair Duvall. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's, let's go deep because I want to. I think we all want to understand this a little bit more. So, um, I'm not an accounting person. UAGC depreciation. What what actually happened there? What what is a depreciation of UAGC, and and how is it that we didn't see it coming? Depreciation and amortization are accounting entries that, that we make at the end of the year. Yep. Uh, so there, this is not a real loss. This is um, it, it's just a, a it's a it's something that we must include in our financials. So when UAGC gave us their annual operating budget, uh, when we submitted our uh, materials to you on May 5th, it did not include depreciation and amortization. You may remember that they were using FASB. Uh, for accounting methods uh, and transition to GASB. I, I think in the transition that uh, they're learning, we are learning, so we were able to grab those numbers after um, the end of the year and pull them in for our audited financial statements. But it's not a cash issue. Yeah. It's uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Good. Second one is the GASB rule change. Mm -hmm. This was a, a surprise rule change? or. No. <laughs> Good question. This yeah. is not a surprise rule change, but it was just implemented two years ago. Right. Uh, so again, we, we are learning how to, um, to update. Uh, one of the things that we had to, um, to change related to that was how we were recognizing all of our new projects, ARB, GCRB, the old chemistry, the capital projects that uh, the state gave us money for. So those had significant uh, in impacts to the financial statements, but again, not, not a real loss, not a cash issue. Okay. Uh, and then third, because you, you did it quickly, but it's pretty important, go back to your paragraph about some of the uh, strategies and options that you think are part of a plan that you're going to bring back to us so right. that we so, can be prepared. Thank you. Uh, um, we really look at this as, as two-pronged. We must focus on the institution as a whole. Uh, so with the if, institutional decisions would be uh, things like are we going to move forward with all the projects in our capital plan that we talked with you about in previous meetings uh, are should we have a hiring pause across the institution now I've told you that there are uh, 
there are only specific units that have acute issues. So a hiring pause could, if we implemented across the entire institution, would have an impact on our mission, uh, could have an impact on how we, we move forward with grants and contracts. We think about a salary increase program. The last, the last several years we've had a 4% salary increase program. When we go through our budget process, every single one of our units has talked about the competition for talent. Uh, so we have felt that it was, it was important to make investments uh, in our employees. But with the cash issues that we're facing and the need to build back central reserves, we may um, have to have a different tact for fiscal year 25. Um, we also think about further budget reductions. You know, when, as we go through the process for creating the budget for fiscal year 25, you know, I told you in 24 we, we passed on a 2% budget reallocation to all units on campus. Will we do that again in 25? Or will we make specific targeted budget reallocations? Those decisions will take uh, some time and thought uh, with our executive team and with shared governance um, to, to make decisions. Uh, and then on the, Just yeah, quickly, please, so sure. The budget reallocation to me doesn't sound like a budget cut. It sounds like mm. moving it from one pocket to another. So can you clarify that? It's a budget cut. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I, would, I would add that if you, if you look, which we've looked in great detail, uh, about where we funded our strategic plan, we always funded, we, we always knew we needed to fund it out of our strategic reserves. And so that's uh, going to be a commitment over five years of about $120 million, remembering that uh, a day cash on hand is $6 million. So that's coming to an end. So we're not going to continue to fund the strategic initiatives. I will say uh, we found great success in the students we attracted because we invested a lot of money in student success and attracting students primarily through financial aid. Moreover, our growth, uh, continued growth of probably going to hit about $925 million in research expenditures, totally fueled and uh, uh, jump-started by these strategic investments. Those, those um, uh, monies will not be invested going forward. We, we think we've, and we've always said it was going to be sort of startup money and then uh, the programs would grow and, and then they have to support themselves. Uh, I think philanthropy is going to be uh, a really important part of this. Uh, philanthropy is not money that we would use for operating budget, but for instance, um, you know, I'm leaving here to drive to a big kickoff of our, uh, the public phase of our $3 billion campaign, which I think will exceed that goal. Um, but that money won't be used for operating budget. It will free up some of the money uh, that we currently use from our reserves to fund uh, scholarships and things like that. So every dollar we get from graduate student stipends or undergraduate uh, student research or, or student uh, scholarship, undergraduate student scholarship, or funding for big uh, moonshot type programs we won't have to fund that centrally. So we made a bet on spending money, we just, uh, we overshot. Can, may I continue for a yeah, second, thank, Madam Chair? Yeah, thank you. Would you go back to the, the cash on hand chart that, that we saw, and I just want to talk about that for a second. Can you help me with that? That's all right, I, I, people I, remember it. Um, so I guess what I would want to convey about this, it, look, so much to applaud about mission success. I think that's a given and, and do recognize that we appreciate that success. But that decline in cash on hand obviously is a wake-up call for all of us and, and we know you get that. Um, our policy requires a plan which we've talked about and I, it sounds like you guys are beginning to, to formulate it. I, I want to communicate two things. Um, the first is we've got your back on tough decisions. Uh, given the four-year decline, we can't have a fifth. So we understand, and I know you understand, we've got to turn this around. So um, don't, please don't underclub this crisis. I mean, hit it. Turn this thing around. And 
if that means that we need to postpone the salary increases, if that means we need to look at retirement, these are tough choices with people we care about that are fundamental to the institution. This is the most fundamental piece of the institution. And so um, we will have your back on, on some of these hard choices as to prioritization. Just know that. Number two, uh, and it was interesting that it would just sort of randomly, to some extent, teed up by President Crow's <coughs> comments. We've been talking about changing the budget model for a long time, and I, we understand that is a tough piece of business. The urgency of getting control, of reclaiming dollars and getting control over more of your budget is more present than ever. And this is no longer a let's get to it, you know, when we can. It is let's get to it now. We will take the heat with you. It is hard. You've got to have more optionality. You've got to have more tools in your chest. And you can't get there with the remnant legacy components of RCM. We know that. I think you know that. We also know it's hard work. But it has to happen, and it has to happen sooner rather than later. And we're expecting that to be part of the plan. Yeah, I think one of the mistakes we made, we converted from RCM to AIB. Uh, and that provided more money to flow centrally. One of the, and again, I'm probably going to get sideways with our provost uh, because he was uh, one of the architects of our RCM and implementing it. Um, one of the things that President Crow told me the first day that I got here, yep. you got to get rid of RCM. Yes. Uh, and Regent Penley has also uh, I did tell you given, that too. yes, yes, <laughs> and continues to tell me that. Uh, so AIB was a move yep. more towards the model that President Crow and I think NAU use, what I call incremental budgeting or more central uh, centralized budgeting. In the implementation, and Ryan can comment on this because I wasn't here, but in the implementation of RCM, there was a guiding principle that we will hold no one harmless, or they will hold everyone harmless, uh, that we won't harm any unit or any college. That was only supposed to last for a year, but we never got off of the, the, the keeping people harmless. When we implemented AIB, we made the same mistake, that uh, we, we tried to uh, hold everyone uh, harmless in implementing AIB, and I think that was a fundamental flaw. The other thing, and I don't know if Casey's on, on the Zoom, but uh, the other thing that Regent Penley has been talking to me about since I got here is this four-year guarantee on uh, tuition. Yes. That's a great uh, differentiator for us, And but if it's going to cost us money, which it does, then I think we've got to look at that's another hard decision. Yes. And, the and, and, and then I'll come back to athletics. Yes. I mean, I think that um, athletics is a very uh, difficult problem. I, I have plans for almost everything, and athletics is, is really a tough one. Uh, given what's going on right now. I mean, even the Ohio State University had to borrow $50 million from the university to fund uh, athletics. And we've been talking to Morgan and President Crow about how they're going to deal with it. I, I don't know of an athletic department in this country that's not losing money. Um, the, the difference is we've never funded athletics out of the university. It's been what I would call a... Um, uh, formula uh, auxiliary unit that floated it on its own bottom and now um, that's not sustainable so I think you're seeing more universities starting to fund athletics which is not something that we've ever done um, and we've done it through internal loans which came out of our days cash on hand with the great promise and we were always optimistic that the Big 12 is going to be the solution it's not so We've we've got to we've got to figure the athletics side out as well. Thank you. Well, in, in places in places like Texas and Ohio State, well, they can just flow money over because they've got money. Uh, one of the big parts of uh, of the uh, the philanthropic campaign will be focused on student scholarships, graduate stipends, funding um, strategic funding of these big uh, ideas, but also the arts and athletics because I think we've underperformed on uh, fundraising for athletics. Yeah. But you're going to a bowl, right? <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> no we got two more wins. We only got five games. 
Thank you, President Robbins. Four games. Yeah, um, her yeah, Regent Herbal. Can we get a, a snapshot of the current state of athletics so that we are better schooled to maybe uh, provide some stimulus here in terms of uh, where we need to inject some harm? Well, I, I think, um, you know, I can just speak for us, but I, as I said, I stand by my statement. I, I, you know, show me an athletic department that's making money. Yeah. All right, so this it's a universal thing. At Oregon, you know, they've got Phil Knight. But that's not, that's, that's not good enough because we have to create something that, hem, you know, stops the hemorrhaging here. Yes, as I, so as we should be in a panic mode in, in regard to this. As I always say, and, and, you know, I've said it many times here, all bleeding stops eventually. <laughs> Uh, so yes, it's the basic is. basic tenet of cardiac surgery, <laughs> but so, so what I would say is, I mean, we're we're going deep into this, and uh, you know, do we cut sports? God no. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Regent Pim Lee. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, President Robbins. I appreciate very much what you and Lisa Rolney have described. You, you've you've laid this out clearly to the board, as ugly as it looks. Um, and you've you've addressed the fact that actions are going to have to be taken like the ones that Regent Duval talked about. Uh, but it strikes me, and, and having been through budget issues both here at ASU when I was here years and years ago and also at Colorado State, I, I'm somewhat familiar with the, the plight that you're in. But it strikes me that you've got some immediate actions that have to be taken in the next 60 days. You're going to have to cut salaries withhold salaries or whatever you have to do to reclaim money from the units. You're going to have to, I believe, uh, force uh, a reclaim of budget on your units, on your colleges, of some percentage amount. It's like the old legislative budget cuts that we used to get here in the state in the 80s and early 90s when the legislature said, well, we're going to take 10 percent of your budget back. I'm afraid you all are going to have to turn to each of your colleges and say we're going to have to take some percentage of your budget back and you're going to have to either terminate people, stop purchasing, or doing something else. And I've done all of those things. Clearly you're going to have to have a hiring uh, pause uh, unless there's absolutely a necessity. But then you've got some longer range actions that I think are absolutely essential. And you've addressed them with your comments about uh, activity informed budgeting. It has to be junk. You have a centralized budgeting program that has to be put in place immediately. You have also, based on your admissions and your use of scholarship money, overspent on that, as you all have admitted. Complete remodeling of the scholarship financial uh, aid issue has to occur before this gets underway next year. So there's both immediate actions that this board must have, in my view. Obviously, I'm speaking for myself, not the board. But there's also some longer run ones that you're going to have to take. You all have alluded to all of those that I have just stated. But I have to say that uh, having been in your roles, the, this is really tough. And, and I don't mean to suggest it's easy. Uh, it, it's really, really tough uh, because this is going to hurt the university and hurt the faculty and staff to really do what is necessary to reach the minimum policy required uh, days on hand of cash that you must have. I, I wish it were otherwise because I love the strategic initiatives that you've undertaken. I love the progress that you've made in so very many ways. But uh, this is a serious, and I think Regent Duvall used the word crisis, and it is a serious crisis that we confront as a board and you confront, and like I said, I've been in your roles, not your role, but your role, and I know how bad this is and how awful it is to take the actions that are so necessary. So I have both empathy for you and regret that those actions must be taken. Thank you. Regent Thank Monty. you. Regent yeah, uh, just one point. We did make $83 million this year, and I don't know if you put that over in days cash on hand and you make it look better by 12 or 14 days. Uh, but I, I am confident that we have solutions to this issue. Yeah, thank you. So Lisa, thank you very much for giving us 
an update and action plan. And sometimes, you know, we know that it's going to be hard to, to make this decision, but you, you went through all the process and the things that need to be taken with, you know, the support of President Robin and all the comments. So um, having said that, so the board, you know, just to, to continue of what the next step will be is the board guidelines for liquidity measures outlines that target range for cash levels that each university is expected to maintain in order to remain financially healthy. And you are working toward that. Um, so given that discussion regarding the decline in monthly um, days cash on hand and the fact that the fiscal year 23 and projected fiscal year 24 measures are well below the board's target range, I'm repeating the same thing that we know, but those guidelines require that the University of Arizona submit a report to the board that details the reason for the deviation, although you gave us the explanation already, and outlines a corrective action plan in order to restore appropriate cash liquidity levels. So having said that, um, and I know Lisa, President Robbins, you are very into you know, um, the actions that needs to be taken. So we're requesting that the University of Arizona submit their corrective action plan in writing uh, to the board office by December 15th, outlining the changes that will be made to rebuild cash levels and ensure the proper controls are in place such that this does not happen again. Without not notice to the board that the university intends to temporarily venture outside of the policy guidelines for compelling um, strategic reasons. So, you know, we heard both of you, the board, you know, is expecting to, you know, that all this action will happen and we will rebuild those uh, cash days. And this was only a, um, an agenda item for discussion. So we thank you for the work that you have put behind Lisa, President Robin too, and the board will be, you know, um, available anytime if you need a future discussion. So, but this is what we are intending to do for December 15th, okay? May I say, yeah. uh, Chair Mata, I, I appreciate all of your comments and I, I appreciate your support and look forward to uh, working with President Robbins and our executive team to bring this plan to you. This is, we take this very seriously, just as you do, and uh, Regent Penley, I, I have regret as well. So look forward to <laughs> being able to report uh, more positive news in the future. Thank you. So we're going to move to the next item. Thank you very much. I don't think Did we have any other comments, right? Okay, perfect. And I think okay, I'm you're going, going to stay there, yeah, because, <laughs> yeah. So the next item is approval of tuition and fee changes for the 2024-2025 academic year in order to simplify student fees at the University of Arizona. Um, first, I will ask, um, uh, in, in, in this item, um, Brad, we will review a suite of a new and adjusted fees for 2024-2025 academic year. So I'm going to have Brad first, you know, uh, introduce this item, and then we'll follow up by you. Okay. Thank you, Regent Mata, uh, Regents. So I'm introducing this item first because this is the first time that we've talked about tuition and fees after we, uh, the board approved the new tuition and fee policy last spring. So right after we promised not to talk about it soon, we're talking about it again. <laughs> So the, the reason this is important, or the baseline here, is that all of the tuition and fee levels that the universities currently have have been individually approved by the board. And past practice was that those would be represented and changed each year, and the board would improve that suite of fees and tuition levels uh, individually again. Now that the board has approved a multi-year growth rate limiter on those fees, we don't have to review those details every year. However, the board does need to weigh in anytime there's a proposal to add a new tuition level or fee or to change a, an existing tuition or fee level at a rate that exceeds what was approved in the multi-year limits. So in our business process, we've anticipated having one to two times a year when the universities might come forward with uh, proposals to add tuition levels for new programs, to make exceptions, and so forth. So this is the window that we have selected for the fall in order to make those targeted adjustments. It just so happens that this one is a little bit bigger because the University of Arizona is following up on a commitment made to the board in previous years to streamline their course fee structure. 
So we're going to turn it over today to Lisa to talk through a suite of changes that we're asking the committee to review that would allow the University of Arizona to get rid of the litany of course fees that are charged at the undergraduate and graduate levels and replace them with a more streamlined structure. So then all three of the state universities will go to this uh, more modular streamlined fee structure. Yeah. Lisa. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Chair Monta. Uh, so, it, Brad, tease me up perfectly. So we are following the Regents' directive to simplify, and our, I personally really appreciated that directive. Uh, our, our bills are very complicated. Having had two children go through University of Arizona and trying to decipher the bills, I often have to create my own spreadsheet to figure out whether we were built correctly. It's a little ridiculous. Uh, so the structure that we're proposing for our undergraduate fee reform is consistent with what you've already seen ASU and NAU implement. And I would like to thank uh, our partners in ASUA and GPSC. And we have our GPSC representative here in the room today. Uh, they have worked with us on these models as well as colleagues across campus. So as Brad said, uh, we, we're only bringing things forward that don't uh, comply with the max growth rates or are new. So what we, you do, will not see today are the things that are here on the slide. These will be announced on November 15th because all of the proposed changes for these components are either at or below the max growth rate. So. What we are asking for your approval today uh, is the creation of a college fee. And that's similar to uh, what ASU and NAU implemented. And I just wanted to let you know uh, how much we are streamlining. So we are eliminating seven differential tuitions, 30 undergraduate program fees, and 420 course fees, rolling those all into one college uh, fee tier structure. Then we're also rolling all of our mandatory fees, 10 of them, into one fee, the student engagement fee. So our undergraduate student bills will now have three major components, just tuition, the college fee, and the student engagement fee. The, the one exception would be for students who are in the Frankie Honors College. The board carved out the ability to maintain a program fee for honors students, and all three institutions have maintained that. Um, our proposal for graduate students was in collaboration with um, GPSC, and it, it well, it's at, part of it is at your directive. We will eliminate 377 course fees uh, that graduate students paid, but the big change is that we are rolling all mandatory fees that graduate students pay directly into tuition. So you'll see an, uh, what looks like a significant increase in the tuition rate, but it's because we are bundling all the mandatory fees that graduate students pay into tuition. So students will only have one line item, graduate students will only have one line item on their bill, that's tuition, except for if they, the specific program that they have selected has a program fee that you have already approved. And this will serve um, to reduce some of the financial burden that our graduate students face because it will enable them to allow sponsored and gift awarded remission to cover their total cost of attendance. Most sponsored projects and gifts say we'll pay for tuition only, so then the student has been um, left to cover the cost of mandatory fees and those are substantial. This is a, a, a big change and a help to our graduate student population. The next thing that you see is uh, an increase to our Frankie Honors College fee from $475 to $600. Um, this fee increase was went through the, uh, the process of conversation and discussion with students, and it, it will help us maintain the robust student-centered um, efforts that our honors students need. You know, think about, expand, we'll be able to expand honors courses, faculty fellows, uh, fellowships, research projects, mentoring, internships, advisory support, and we'll create additional revenue that will help um, better student support for through stipends and scholarships and work studies with this incremental increase to the program fee. The change that's proposed for nursing is essentially financially equivalent. What we have had is a fixed fee program for the Masters uh, of Science in Nursing, the entry to the profession of nursing, which we call MEPIN because that is way too long to say over and over again. Uh, that fixed fee approach, approach was a $48,000 total program fee for residents and $68,000 for non-residents. 
we are moving to eliminate that fixed fee because it's incredibly administratively burdensome to adjust the tuition and program fees every semester uh, and every year as the tuition changes at the university. And we'll move to a $5,000 per term program fee for both residents and non-residents. We anticipate that this shift will be financially equivalent both for the student and uh, the total investment or the, the revenue that we receive to, to support the cost of the program. Then you'll see a, um, the inaugural per credit uh, program fee, I'm sorry, distance rate for our new program um, in business analytics that will be uh, offered in Chandler. So you have uh, $1,350 in state and $1,600 out of state. And finally, uh, we have an MDMT, MDMPH program that uh, has been offered at College of Medicine Phoenix uh, at $750 a term for a program fee. We are uh, ensuring parity between both of our colleges of medicine, so implementing the same fee for the MDMPH program at College of Medicine Tucson. I'll stop there and ask if there are any questions. There are a lot of changes. Thank you, Lisa. Are there any questions? In the write-up, you talk about the uh, the new fees generating $38 million, and there's a sentence that follows that says it's going to cover, basically it's going to be offset the fees that will be subtracted almost. Uh, is there a differential? Uh, there is a differential. Um I, I will have to get to back, I'm sorry, I don't I'll remember the exact uh, uh, increase off the top of my head, but there is a, a somewhat of an increase that we'll be able to um, pass on to cover expenses, recognizing that there's inflation uh, for fees that are covered by course fees, for, or expenses that now, are typically covered by course fees. When I first fees. read it, I thought, whoa, they're going to make $38 million out of this. <laughs> Yeah. Then I read it a bit more carefully, and it, and you kind of hedged it. Yes, this offsets, yeah. but it, you didn't make the statements that they totally offset. Well, I, I guess the uh, uh, Regent Herbold, what, what was important to us as we uh, created the college fee model is that yes, we need to cover all of our expenses, and we would like to have a little more revenue, recognizing there's an inflation in the expenses that are covered by these fees, but we also don't want to create a, a financial burden for our students that's not sustainable. So the goal was to uh, be a, a reasonable uh, as we made the adjust the, the conversion. On another score, you had mentioned before, President Robbins, this notion of uh, holding the, the tuition level constant for four years. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about that in the past. Do you carry around a figure in your mind that says if we did away with this, it would turn up X dollars? Regent Herbal, that's an excellent question. Uh, one of the things that you'll see in our proposal uh, that, that does not require board approval, but we, we wanted to give you notice, uh, our guarantee has always had tuition and mandatory fees were guaranteed. Uh, we are removing the guarantee on the mandatory fees beginning fall of 25. We, we, want, we were considering doing it fall of 24, but we have already admitted students with who have been recruited with meant to have a guarantee on tuition and mandatory fees. I, I promise I'll answer your question. Uh, so we're, we're eliminating that portion. We, we think that it's really difficult to determine what would be the, uh, the increase from eliminating the guarantee because what we saw was a significant increase in retention when we put the guarantee in place. So yes, we would be able to charge all the existing students, say, 3% more. Uh, for residents on an annual basis, but we don't know how many students, especially non-residents, we would lose who then we wouldn't have any tuition from if we don't retain them because the increase on the annual basis is too much for them to handle. So, so does this mean you don't carry around a figure in your head? I don't carry around a figure in my head. <clears throat> but she said it's about 3% per year. So cumulative, it would be about me. Yeah, meaningful money. Yes. You should revisit this. this other schools don't have, have this? <coughs> You're correct, Regent Herbal. We are the last institution in the state that has a guaranteed tuition program. But many of our competitive peers, 
the University of Colorado Boulder, Texas A&M, uh, UT Austin do have guaranteed tuition. Yeah, they've got lots more money. So <laughs> Regent Penley's been on me about this from the first It's day. real money. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say that we actually considered eliminating our guarantee with all of these changes. But one of the things that we're, you know, we have so many changes that we're rolling out at once, we felt like we needed some more time to evaluate. And I, I take your, uh, your questions as suggestions to continue that evaluation. Thank you. Is there uh, any other question? Here now, since this is an action item, thank you, Lisa, for, uh, for the briefing. I move that the committee forward to the board the changes to tuition and academic and mandatory fees requested for the 2024-2025 academic year by the University of Arizona in its proposal and, is, and as presented in the executive summary. Is there is a second? Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. He's not voting. Do. Any abstention? Motion passes. Thank you very much. So item number five, we're going to table item number five and moving to the next item, number six. Proposed board adoption of a board policy 4-406 spouses and dependents of law enforcement officers tuition scholarship, first reading. So item number six is the first reading of a board policy and 4-406 spouses and dependents of law enforcement officers tuition scholarship. So Sam Blevins will be brief, briefly discuss this item and answer board questions regarding the policy. Sam. Good afternoon, um, yeah. Regents. The board office asks uh, this committee to review and forward to the board for first reading um, the policy that will implement le recent le legisla legislation, particularly uh, the legislature created a pilot program for the spouses and dependents under 27 of law enforcement officers and correction officers. Um, they did that in the budget bill, and so this policy will be implementing that program. It will be effective in fall of 2024 and will run through fiscal year 26-27. Um, the policy is in the executive summary, and I would be happy to answer any questions on it. Thank you, Sam. If there's any questions by the region? Well, here none. Since this is an action item, I move that the committee forward to the board for first reading of the proposed adoption of a board policy 4-406, spouses and dependents of law enforcement officers tuition scholarships, as described in the executive summary. Is there is a second? Second. Thank you. Is there all in favor say aye? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carried. So, the next item is review of Northern Arizona University Campus Master Plan. Um, campus Master Plans are required by board policy, and we look forward to hearing any use vision for its campus. Again, we're going to have uh, Bajoran flux staff that will address the committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Mata. Uh, members of the committee, joining uh, me here is are uh, a few members of our team, and that is uh, what I was uh, making sure that we uh, had them. So I will introduce uh, everyone here. Uh, to my right, uh, we have uh, Stephanie Bauer, our. AVP for Facility Services, and Andrew Iacona, who is our project manager for our Campus Master Plan project. And to my left, we have uh, a couple of our DLR uh, partners who helped us through uh, this process of 18 months, Lindsey Graf uh, to my immediate left, and Megan Storm uh, to her left. So we have uh, a few slides uh, to walk through what uh, is in essence a, like mentioned, 18 month process. So distilling all of this information down to about a dozen slides from 18 months, a number of outreach sessions uh, is a lot uh, uh, of information. Um, you have not seen a campus master plan uh, come to the board. Uh, I don't think, if, if I remember correctly, none of the current board members have seen a campus master plan. Um, 
Uh, ours uh, is the first one submitted uh, since 2010. Uh, and, and that gives you a little bit of idea uh, of all uh, three universities' campus master plans. Um, I want to just give a few more comments just before we get into some of the, the details that, you know, this is a, a framework. Uh, there's a lot of projects on this, it's, but it's forward looking for a decade. Um, you will see projects come forward to the board for approval that align with this framework. Um, so not to necessarily get into all the projects, not all the project financing uh, right now, but this is a you know, rough outline of projects. So you should see projects come th to the board that is consistent uh, with this framework. Not everything in this plan will get implemented. Uh, one of the things that, uh, and I think uh, Regent Brewster had asked uh, in June, what was, how many projects were, up, uh, were included uh, from the 2010 projects that were actually implemented? And we had gone through uh, and we mapped out uh, all the different projects. There were some projects that were not even uh, included because they were not even on the horizon. The kit recital hall is a perfect example. That uh, came up uh, that was not included in the uh, campus master plan in 2010, uh, but we went forward because of uh, funding that became uh, available and we went forward to do that. Other projects had indicated demolition of buildings. One good example of that is our uh, what was the chemistry building now is our science annex. We have invested in that uh, building uh, using SIF or the capital infrastructure funding and we did not dem demolish that and that's now being used uh, quite extensively on our north campus for uh, uh, our science uh, programs. So it is a framework but it's not a rigid framework. That's really what you know, my point is. Uh, it's a guide, uh, a guide that we will use uh, to evaluate uh, and plan uh, the physical campus, largely the Flakes campus over the next decade. So with that, I'm going to oh, get used to this. This slide is really a, a, a framework of some key principles uh, that we utilized uh, and, and that really guide the, the projects uh, that we have uh, on the horizon. You can see some of those key things being thinking about how do we strengthen our connection to community? What are those key connecting points uh, from campus to the community um, and, and having that be a prominent feature of our campus master plan. How do we improve our east-west connections? Many of you are you know, very familiar that our, our, our primary uh, geographic orientation is north-south. We are a very north-south campus. Um, we have a, 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 a pedway um, uh, that is utilized that's very prominently north-south. How can we improve that connection going east-west and, 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 and really focusing in on that? How do we utilize under, uh, underutilized spaces? What are the processes? How do we approach that? We have a number of work arrangements right now for, with staff coming out of the pandemic where we have hybrid work. How can we really utilize underutilized space because of that or just in general uh, because of uh, you know, departments that you know, are not necessarily located all in the same building? Um, one of the, the, the stats that uh, I asked uh, to, for this uh, discussion was the School of Earth and Sustainability one school is in 13 different buildings. How can we consolidate and better utilize space so that we get synergies within that school? And that talks about the, the bottom left. How do we consolidate uh, uh, academic uses and, and buildings within geographic areas? And then thinking about how do people, how do vehicles flow across campus coming onto campus throughout the day, um, getting around campus, how can we be more effective in getting people around so that we really do emphasize safety and how do we emphasize uh, uh, pedestrians, bicyclists, you know, moving north-south and east-west. One of the key things to deferred maintenance. 
the 2010 plan had a very strong emphasis in new buildings. There were 20 new buildings in the 2010 plan. This plan right now focuses on those key new buildings being approximately four new academic buildings. So a very large flip from new buildings to deferred maintenance. And the deferred maintenance is, in terms of gr gross square footage, three times as much in this plan as in the 2010 plan. So a very large you know, focus, intentional focus on using space and uh, investing in what we currently have. So th just in general, that's a, a strong uh, framework uh, for our uh, campus master plan. So. No, thank you. But you oh, good. okay. Just continue. Yes. Okay. So as we think about new buildings, uh, you can see some of the, 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 the stats in the bottom left, you know, gross square footage and, and bets. Uh, we did hear in some of our uh, outreach sessions uh, with the community that one of the things, and, and this is the, the comment that relates to beds, is the desire for the community to see, can you house uh, additional students on campus? And, and that would be one of the projects that we would uh, pursue, uh, likely a partnership project, uh, you know, using our uh, American Campus Communities uh, partner. But that would be one of the, the, the new projects in terms of new buildings, in terms of how do we uh, uh, address that f feedback and input from the community. I mentioned that we do not have identified for new buildings uh, a, a very significant amount of net new academic or uh, administrative space. One of those uh, is the, as it's transitioned from a STEM building to an ITSB building to uh, what is now uh, an interdisciplinary science and academic complex uh, name, would be utilizing capital infrastructure funds, the SIF funds. That would be a central uh, component uh, in the central campus, and it's really that old building, uh, if you can see, uh, uh, at the central campus. If there are questions, uh, certainly uh, stop, and, and we can certainly answer those. Yeah, thank you. If there's any question, no, you can continue if, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. How many total uh, beds do you have today? Regent Herbold, I think we have, you know, within NAU housing inventory, I, if I remember correctly, about seven to 8,000 and about 3,000 more for American campus community. And that's up from last year because you converted doubles to triples. That is correct, uh, uh, Regent yeah. Manson. We did increase the capacity from last year because we intentionally, because uh, we were seeing the demand uh, from especially uh, upper class students wanting to come back to campus uh, to, to make that conversion. Can I do a follow up? Yeah. yeah. On the campus communities, is that your utilization or are you under contract to provide that many students to them as part of our P3 arrangement? So when we, um, so I think there's uh, two, two uh, questions there. Uh, the conversion of uh, the beds was ent done ent almost entirely, almost, within the university housing beds, not within our partnership with uh, American Campus Community. However, we did uh, have discussions at about this time last year uh, that they did make some limited conversions uh, into to, uh, to have additional capacity. So we have that discussion each year um, um, when we meet with them, uh, but they're really contracted to provide the housing uh, you know, as they, they have and they pay us you know, the ground rent uh, for each of the buildings that they you know, uh, operate. The uh, market risk is completely there. Correct. Okay. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, in, any other question? Okay. You can continue. Thank you. I mentioned the emphasis on deferred maintenance. Um, not only uh, are we looking to address, and you can see the number, 80 plus million dollars in deferred maintenance costs over these next few, uh, next decade, but 
really leaning into deferred maintenance and renovations as a, a primary tool to address campus because of that really aligns with sustainability. The most sustainable building largely is a building that is already in place rather than building a new building. Um, so that's not always the case, but it's largely the case. So we are, you know, looking to really lean into renovations, um, really optimizing that space that we currently have and making it more modern, more useful, more effective in terms of space. Can I ask a question? Yes, return my How many of those buildings are going to be renovated? All the buildings right here um, that you can see on this screen, uh, and I think it totals 23? 20, yeah, 20, 23. 23. 24, including both plants. Okay, well, thank you. And that is largely a, a, a key factor in terms of four of these, uh, three of the three of these buildings specifically, are the buildings that we noted in terms of the fiscal year 25 state budget request. So three of these buildings would be, you know, addressed uh, with that. You know, our Gamage uh, building on North Campus, our Physical Sciences uh, building, uh, as well as the library. And the library uh, is, in, and all of those need to be invested in, especially on the mechanical. What are those HVAC uh, issues? Uh, what are the fire life safety uh, systems uh, within those buildings? So all three of those buildings would be uh, part of the $50 million that we had you know, submitted for you know, the NAU portion of the uh, 2025 budget request. There are demolitions. Uh, a number of them, uh, and a largely uh, related to a building that is very poor uh, in terms of condition where an investment would not make sense. Uh, or is there a, a geographic location where the density uh, is can be improved upon. That happens in a number of locations if we look at uh, these projects, especially the locations such as our Gateway uh, Center right now. That's in the central part of campus. That's the number three uh, on, the, on the map. It's a very low uh, a story building that can be improved upon uh, in terms of what we can house on that geographic location uh, on campus. And I you know, would not you know, hesitate to, to mention the Milton uh, uh, property, which has been demolished uh, uh, it's a already. Very nice parking lot. <laughs> yes, it is now a parking lot, um, but it has been demo uh, demolished uh, uh, since. Uh, it, I think it was demolished in July. That took off approximately uh, $11 million of deferred maintenance from our number uh, as reported for June 30. Uh, so that property uh, is um, not an eyesore anymore, uh, and you can actually see uh, you know, into campus uh, from Milton. <laughs> is Peterson already demolished? It is not demolished uh, right now, but uh, uh, Regent Manson, uh, Peterson is number eight uh, on there. That would be a project uh, that would be done, and it would be a, what we call an enabling project to allow for the space to become freed up for our, inter, our Isaac or our interdisciplinary science and academic complex building. So it is something that would be on the nearer term uh, that we would need to be doing over the next, you know, one to two to three years in order to go forward with that building, uh, you know, in the future. I mentioned campus edges. One of the items that uh, we uh, continually, you know, 
need to be thinking about how do, uh, just like we were talking about the Milton property, how does our campus connect to the Flagstaff community? What is visually, in terms of signage, how, landscape, how, how can we make improvements with that? One of the items that uh, President Cruz Vivera has consistently mentioned is how do we want NAU to look as people come off of I-17 and I-40? Uh, there, there are uh, a dumpster uh, right now, and, and it's, it's uh, in terms of reference, we can do better in terms of... Uh, that, that's a low bar. Yes, yes. We can, we can absolutely do better in terms of that visual, in terms of signage and landscape. Uh, so this is a key theme, and, and there are a number of different projects that can uh, be done uh, with that. Open space is another key theme. There are a few that are really highlighted on here in terms of some key projects that we really want to do to improve open spaces on campus. One of the key reasons why any uh, students come to NEU is location and, you know, just the space, the, you know, how it interacts uh, with nature, how nature is present uh, on uh, the NAU campus. So what type of projects we, can we do to really emphasize that? Um, South Quad, that's on the southern part of campus in between our engineering uh, and business school. How can we really make an improvement within our South Quad? Transitioning up to the north, uh, northern part of campus, a library plaza, taking out parking in terms of what's between the library and our field house and really making that a really key uh, memorable open space uh, in terms of where students can gather uh, and really emphasizing that. At the same time, not losing track that there are some key investments, small key investments that can be done along the way. We don't necessarily need to just wait for those key big projects, that we can make smaller improvements within landscaping that really can add to the overall campus feel. So that's one of the things that, you know, small projects, really emphasizing that. I mentioned circulation. Circulation is something that we are, are going to focus in on, and that relates to especially how do people move throughout the day uh, on campus. Can we look at closing certain streets down to vehicular traffic other than our bus system and emergency vehicles to really emphasize cyclists and pedestrian uh, traffic. That's really the, the third bullet there related to pedestri uh, pedestrianize uh, Knowles and Humphreys, one of our key north-south and east-west uh, uh, streets. How can really really make it more appealing uh, and, and safe? for cyclists and, and pedestrians. Thinking about making further investments in our Pedway. You know, we've made investments on our Pedway on our North Campus, making it further down, uh, coming down in terms of consistency on format, but also adding some of strong east-west connections between, uh, you know, for instance, our library and our you know, health and learning center. How can we really emphasize you know, those east-west connections? And making the continued move of parking from interior to exterior. You know, if, we're, if we make the uh, investment to go forward with a library plaza, that will then take parking lot off line, then we would look to see, can we invest, can we uh, build a parking structure to house that on North Campus? So that is really, you know, a key, uh, you know, how can we, you know, think about where parking uh, spots are? I've mentioned uh, housing 
uh, th th certainly we would be looking to have stages within any potential additional housing right now. Uh, we would be looking uh, uh, in the first uh, phase of our housing project would be on South Campus, uh, closer to our Sky Dome uh, of about 500. Um, and we uh, would only go beyond anything related to a uh, you know housing uh, development if the demand continued to be there. But right now, the demand certainly would look like 500 uh, beds on South Campus would be a great addition uh, to help not only NAU but also the community and take some pressure off of the community uh, housing too. Those last few points on this slide just really relate to as we think about where services are located and if we do move forward with a housing complex on the southern part of campus we need to be thinking about what services also are there on the southern part of campus to support those students. So dining and, and wellness, very, very um, focused on the northern part of campus right now. So seeing, do, do we have a dining expansion uh, you know, at the Union on South Campus to support additional students? Can we have additional facilities to help support the recreation space on South Campus as we have more students on South Campus? So phase one, really, I mentioned the phrase enabling projects. There's a certain number of enabling projects uh, that we would be looking at. Uh, Regent Manson mentioned the de demolish of uh, Peterson. That is uh, one that we would be looking at. We also have a couple of key renovations uh, that would be you know, needing to be done. Uh, renovations of Burry Hall, uh, you know, which would provide some swing space. Uh, and that is, is currently being worked on uh, in terms of a very first project. But we also need to add more swing space uh, in, in the first phase to allow for those subsequent uh, projects. So another key swing space is a renovation within our South Beaver School uh, to add some additional academic space to allow for other space to come offline. Is Beaver a historic property? So you're stuck in terms of most of what you can do. Right. Uh, Regent Manson, yes, that is correct. So it, it will g need to be uh, very purposeful in terms of how we uh, approach uh, renovations of, of that. And, and as I go back to phase, phase one, phase one is really a, a roughly five-year period, roughly five years. Um, and I say roughly because this, again, this is a framework. It's not a rigid, um, you need to do all of these projects before you can do anything in phase two. It, if something comes up in terms of funding and opportunity, a phase two or th three project may be pulled forward within the next five years or vice versa. If something does not come up, a phase one project might be pushed back. However, phase one projects really are the, the right now, the more uh, prioritized listing of, of projects. Phase two, um, continued um, uh, academic uh, investment, especially the, the deferred maintenance. Uh, we've got a couple of additions identified for the phase two, a Klein Library and then a Du Bois on, uh, a Student Center uh, uh, project, as well as a couple of projects. And the last bullet point is, what do we do with that demolished now parking lot uh, uh, property right there on the edge of campus. Uh, it, it won't be a parking lot forever. Uh, how can we better utilize uh, that property? How can we have uh, a, a community uh, engaged property? Uh, is it a location where uh, a satellite location of our bookstore is so that individuals coming off of Milton uh, could stop at that location and not have to tra uh, traverse into the uh, inter part of campus? So that's an idea. Um, having that in phase two allows time to have some discussions with the community and to see what might be the best utilization uh, uh, for the community. Phase three is really approaching that, you know, eight, nine, ten years, uh, thinking about uh, housing. 
if that housing demand still exists, that's really what you know a a you know additional housing would be kind of towards the end of that period uh, of time, end of that decade, um, and really the additional work you know thinking about not only the Milton property um, that we've been talking about, but also what used to be the Arizona uh, credit union credit union property that you know we, the the university had purchased several years ago. What can be done uh, more purposefully on that northern part of campus, right off of our Butler uh, Ave, uh, Butler Avenue, that might also be a community a you know potentially mixed use uh, residents, uh, maybe for uh, you know, graduate students on that part of, of campus. So I know a lot of you are, are thinking about a lot of great projects. This, if you total everything, if you, if you total everything up in terms of phases, it's over $2 billion. Uh, and obviously, that's a huge uh, amount of money. Renovations is a third uh, of this. So, you know, that's the primary, uh, you know, uh, category uh, that we are, are, are looking at. Um, funding will come from a, ver a varied uh, you know, number of sources. Uh, we'll utilize state capital infrastructure funding. We will continue to emphasize uh, you know, uh, requests for deferred maintenance and bid building renewal. We'll continue to look um, with our new uh, vice president for advancement, looking to see what can we do on the philanthropic side. You know, are there some opportunities that, that on that side that could potentially you know, help out with a nursing building or, or other buildings and, and really prioritizing where those types of opportunities are uh, for, for funding. So let me stop there. Uh, that's the last slide. See if there's questions uh, and, and not only myself, but uh, the colleagues from NAU and, and DLR certainly are here to answer questions too. Yeah, thank you, Rajern, and, and thank you for all of that um, excitement on the new, you know, um, project that we have. So if there are any questions by the regions? I just have one question. It's, regions, it's yeah, related to off-campus property that we own kind of out in the sticks over between the airport and Little America. Eastern, and, yes. Yes. <laughs> Is there... Any kind of plan for that? Is that land available to be sold to fund anything on campus? Great question, and 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 for Regents, uh, Regent Manson's question is one of the properties that we had purchased. We had per, uh, purchased you know a few properties in a row uh, about five or six years ago. That was one of them. Uh, what we uh, uh, refer to as the Wick property. Uh, it was about 100 acres, uh, and it's on the eastern part of um, Flagstaff. And it needs to have some infrastructure put you know, into there. As some of the streets in Flagstaff are extended, uh, it will eventually get connected uh, to, to, uh, uh, to that infrastructure. To the specific question, that is an option uh, in terms of you know potentially utilizing that you know uh, for uh, you know either sale or exchange you know as we work with community uh, partners uh, work with you know for instance the Flagstaff Unified School District on what their plans are or the city what their plans are there's ongoing discussions on that but that is certainly an option uh, uh, to to do that um, it certainly is an option you know as well you know potentially as we as a community, look at housing for faculty and staff. Maybe that's an option, you know, for looking and utilizing some parcel uh, along those lines in connection, you know, with just community partners. So it is on our radar. Uh, if there's not a specific utilization identified in this plan for that, but it is certainly uh, an, an, an option uh, for Has that. Has there been any development over towards there that makes it a, a, a short term? 
cash flow revenue. Right, right. Okay. So I think uh, right now it would be be more valuable in the future uh, than it is right now once that infrastructure and roadways are put in. And I, and I would say that's probably a five year ish. Uh, like plus. Staff, it might be twenty. <laughs> or 20, uh, 5 to 10, uh, for, uh, in terms of being able to, to really see the, the best uh, monetization of that property. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I What's its current Regent value? Um, that is, we are working, uh, Regent Herbal, we are working on that. I, uh, I believe we purchased it for $3 million. Regent Penley? Uh, Bjorn, I'd just like to laud you and your team for taking what is usually a perfunctory process required by many boards <laughs> and turning master planning into something with high utility for the university. So it strikes me you've really exploited uh, the requirement in a really successful way. So, so I, I just offer my personal appreciation. <clears throat> you've addressed so many issues that I've observed on the campus, including the signage one where uh, the first few times I went skiing uh, up in the mountains from Phoenix, I asked myself, well, where is NAU anyway? <laughs> so uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing where you're going to put the sides because they're, they're highly necessary. I, I like your move toward dealing with deferred maintenance. The I university know. has been doing that as under your leadership in, in your role for some time, and I think a continuation of that is excellent. The open spaces are so very important. I mean, I love the, the walk through the woods from the dome mm -hmm. over uh, up toward the administration building and through those pathways. Uh, so the open spaces are really great. I like your attention to the South Campus, which has high needs for all the issue, things you addressed in terms of dining, health care, bookstore, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, I, I, I like that and the additional beds there because nestled in that wooded section, you really have a sense of comfort. It's a space that's really comfortable. And I can imagine if I were a student, I'd really like living there, uh, even though dining is farther away. Right. Right. But the space is great. So I, I just uh, laud what you all are doing. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Um, you mentioned, not in this briefing, um, the master plan, do, do we have that school, old school that, that is in the corner that would that could be a potential buy-in or part oh. of the master plan. Yeah. Yes, Region Mata. Um, that is um, a uh, location that's just adjacent uh, to our campus. It's a uh, Kinsey Elementary School, part of uh, FUSD. Uh, they are looking for a school uh, to replace Kinsey. Um, over the next uh, three to four years. Uh, so we are uh, uh, working with them to see what their plans are uh, uh, currently uh, um, and to see what we can uh, potentially do uh, in terms of, you know, possibly working with them on a, a location uh, that might utilize some of our uh, real estate. Thank you. Any other question? I just have a final comment. I like, I like signage because it took me twice around the, in the airport to get to your house. Okay. I was late because the signage was not good for me. So I, I, I'm just, this, just, this is just a comment because I was late that day and the parking was full because I, I went in circle there. Okay. I, I do have a question, Regent Mata. Are you getting rid of that secret garden that I like that the Horticulture Club has? Do you know the garden I'm talking about? The flood garden. One. <laughs> garden. <laughs> so as part of our uh, replacement for SBS, because it is between the Social and Behavioral Sciences Building, Raleigh, right. Asher, it is. GS West. It's nestled in a, in, a, in a place that almost no one goes. Yes, there is intention to protect that because it is, it is important to a lot of our programs and our students and faculty. So we do have intentions to maintain that as part of the uh, new facility that will be adjacent to it. I'm, I'm delighted. I like to go there. <laughs> and I like to, 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 to stand there or sit there. Okay. Any other question? Here, none. Uh, we thank you, you know, and the team, you. you know, for all the uh, questions and answers, and, and thank you for the briefing. So, since this is a, a action um, item, so I move that the committee forward to the board for approval of Northern Arizona University's campus master plan, as described in the executive summary. Is there is a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion passes.
Just click on yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Next item is item number a, a review of acquisition of 115 East Helen Street, Tucson, for the University of Arizona. So, um, the University of Arizona requests to purchase residential property of this location. So, Lisa will provide the description of why U of A wants to purchase this property. Thank you, Lisa, for you know for that. Thank you, Chair Monta. This is a rare opportunity to acquire property that's within our planning boundary. It is the last of two parcels on an entire super block that we don't own. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's a, a 9,750 square foot property that's currently used as a multi-tenant rental. Uh, the good news, well, first of all, we obtained the two appraisals that we are required by board uh, that justify the purchase price of $1.875 million. Uh, the good news from a cash perspective is that we will not close on this until a year to allow the tenants who are living there the time to um, finish out their leases. Uh, and once it's ours, we plan uh, you know, on a short-term basis to, to look at the property and see if there's any use that we want that, that we want to use it for something. But in long term, this is a super block that we intend to, to level and go vertical and put housing because we absolutely need more housing on campus and we know that that will pay for itself the second that it's open. So with that, I'll stop and ask if there are any questions. Thank you. There are any questions? Here none, since this is an action item, I move that the committee forward to the, to the board for approval of the University of Arizona request to purchase the residential real property located at 1115 East Helen Street in Tucson in Pima County in Arizona for $1.75 million as described in the executive summary. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion passes. So the committee will recess now and reconvene in the executive session across the hall in the executive conference room for legal advice discussion and direction for designated representatives regarding item of the executive session agenda. The committee will adjourn and end to end in the executive session. So the public meeting is motion. Oh, ah, sorry. Do I have a motion to convene into executive session? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. We're in recess. <laughs> <laughs>